Support for the Forward's Bintel Brief podcast comes from listeners like you and from Edward Blank, whose generosity makes this program possible. I'm Gina. I'm Lynn. And welcome to Eventual Brief, the Jewish Advice Podcast. And we want to answer your questions. Send them to us by calling 201-540-9728 or emailing Bentel at forward.com. That's B-I-N-T-E-L at forward.com. Today we're talking about not only a difficult situation, but for most families, an inevitable one. And that is, as our loved ones grow older, how do we decide how to care for them? Dear Bentel, my 88-year-old father-in-law is still working as a business strategist and counsel and is cogent and has a sharp mind. He is the sole caregiver for his 85-year-old wife, who has mid to late stage Alzheimer's. It is clear that he is overwhelmed and could use a caregiver to help with her daily needs. She's at a stage where she doesn't have any retention of current memories and is also confused by where she is and who he is to her, even though she knows he loves her and takes care of her. He is convinced that he doesn't need any help, that no medically trained caregiver could deal with her better than he can, that he has nothing to learn about how to treat the issues that might come up as the disease continues to progress. Their two sons don't seem to want to interfere. Any advice on what I can or should be doing or not doing? He's very much with it, but his denial and closed-mindedness is keeping her from getting better care and him from getting some relief. Sincerely, Cautious Caregiver. Okay, right off the bat, I just have to say that if you're listening and you know me, you might be thinking, um, Lynn, is this writer you? Because I do relate very specifically to this situation. It's not me. That goes to show that there are many people in this situation. But in yes, in my world, I'm I'm the daughter-in-law of uh, a mother-in-law with advanced Alzheimer's. She's here at home, right downstairs. And my father-in-law is taking care of her. But during the height of COVID, uh, he didn't have help in the house. And The other similarity here is that like cautious caregivers, father-in-law, my father-in-law is actually one of the most capable people I know. Like you want him around at the apocalypse. Mm. You know, he can fashion a tourniquet from a, you know, from a pencil and scotch tape in the, you know, burned out basement of the CVS. Um, He, he, real, real life, he, he made Aliyah a long time ago when he was, you know, a bachelor and actually built a combine you know a large it's like the aircraft carrier of farming equipment from a kit okay wait combines come in kits Mm -hmm. i didn't even realize that yeah that's who he is he thrives on being handy and being helpful and being capable and here he is in this position of let's just say it's it is way more difficult to care for your ailing loved one than it is to build a combine from a kit Mm. so The whole situation has generated, of course, constant questioning and evaluating for my husband and my sister-in-law, not just what does their mom need, but what does their dad need and how can they support him to support her? And I'm involved. I'm part of the family. And so I'm also calibrating how can I support them to support their dad? So Really, as I was saying, cautious caregiver, I feel you, I hear you, I see you, I'm with you. What were some of the big picture considerations that you and your husband and your sister-in-law have been doing over these years in, with y'all and, and your mother-in-law? I think the top line consideration for them is what would she want? And right up there is how can they support their dad? And there's also, of course, the conundrum with Alzheimer's where you, there's a lot of guesswork. <laughs> we don't really know what she wants or needs. We just have to do our best. Really, the hard part is distinguishing, you know, what's best for her and what's best for my father-in-law and the situation. It's not always that the two are at odds at all, what's best for her and what's best for him. It's just that they're so deeply intertwined. It's, it makes decision-making even harder. Right. So let me ask you this, Len, again, bringing your personal story into this. 
you and Pasha's caregiver are both the in-laws. Yeah. Is there a difference between the amount of influence or responsibility between the in-law who married into the family <laughs> versus the sons who, in your case, Anne and hers, are born to the parents? What What's the there there? Yeah, I think there's a vast difference. I'm here as support for the support team. So my role includes directly just supporting my husband in figuring all this out and all the stupid phone calls to the stupid agencies. And then also, I got my own life skills that I can bring. So on this team, I'm basically the gardener and the caterer because I know how to cook and I know how to cook to their tastes. And so I can manage helping make sure they have meals most nights of the week. And I also love to garden, so I've taken over their garden. So when they still, you know, look out their window, they can see they can see their nice their nice greenery. To be clear, I would also say my other role is resisting making PowerPoints <laughs> because my other natural proclivity would be to, would be to fix everything. I mean, I cannot fix everything. Believe me, I don't mean to say that I can actually fix this situation. I cannot. But I'm the one who'd be like, I've I've created a spreadsheet of all the all the support groups and would show up with binders full of information. And that is not that's not what they need. So and actually so actually the best advice I've gotten is to go ahead and make those lists and make those PowerPoints and make those binders and just have them. Mm. Don't give them to anybody. Makes me feel better. It's fine. If one day they need them, they're there. But, but at the same time, Lynn, like they might not have needed that half binder at the moment that you prepared it, but it might have been super useful a year later or two years later when everyone had the family meeting and agreed that we're in a place where we need to make different decisions, right? And here, and actually Lynn's PowerPoint, you were able to like whip it out, right? My dad used to, my, my dad used to say, you know, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And it's like, you got ready before, and now you're able to lay out before the family. Here are some steps that we can take. Here are some options. Here are some choices. Here are some possibilities. And I think the other piece of that possibility piece is that, you know, there is a lot of daylight between moving her into a home and having someone who might come by the house, you know, three days a week and help with X or Y task or activity. There are so many things. So many things. Totally. I think that a lot of times before people actually confront this situation, they think that like really the only choices are have this person languish at home or languish in a home. Mm. And that is very much not the case. There are so many things, so many things. That's the thing about all these resources. They may not need someone in a lab coat. They might just need someone with a book. But it does feel like she has kind of a set idea, even though it's obviously coming from a place of kindness and concern and compassion. I wonder if she has kind of a set idea of how things should be or could be. And she's just frustrated at her position and feeling, you know, not able to make those things happen. So she's correct. She's definitely correct that he could use his help. We could all use some help. But she might not be right, you know? She might not be right. And I think part of the not being right is something that you mentioned earlier about, you know, the, the care that's being taken here and what else is happening within this relationship with the mother-in-law and the father-in-law. There is a lot of care here, a lot of love, a lot of honor and devotion and commitment that is on display from the husband to his wife of 50 plus years, right? There's a degree of just devotion that is present here that I don't think can be underestimated and felt also and needed perhaps by the mom. Yes, totally. And I, I really do want to underscore before we move on to even larger considerations that I think I think the father's role here is not just a factor. I think it's the factor. Right. It's the factor. So I have a friend whose mom was was chronically ill her whole life. Her life was difficult. Caring for her was very difficult. But my friend's father did it day in, day out for years and years and years. And my friend would even say, Dad, you know, how do you do this? How do you do this? 
And his dad would say, she's my wife. Mm. I married her. I took a vow. And I'm not, 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 not saying that we should all suffer, that we should, that we're doomed to any agreement we make to suffer through it and not find a, a healthy, responsible way out of things that are just too much. I'm not saying we should be murderers, anything like that. But to bring it back to this, to this guy, I think he just wants to take care of his wife in the way that, you know, during, during this, well, current pandemic, especially last year, last spring, those of us who are parents or those of us who are any kind of caregivers, we just took care of the people. We, we did it. It was not awesome, but we did it. And there was, it, it's what you do. It's why I'm here. Which is not to say we can find joy, but none of this is easy. All of this is hard. Caring for family members is hard. And also, side note, those of us who are, you know, in our 40s, 50s, 50s, who have young-ish kids and also aging parents, you know, they used to call it the sandwich generation. It's like the club sandwich generation, I always say, because, you know, we have our own aches and pains (laughs) at this point. And it's a lot. It's a lot. I dearly love all of the aging members of my family, but I would give caring for aging parents one star on Yelp. It's just, it is hard. It is hard. So for you, cautious caregiver, a couple of practical things and then some more philosophical things. So practical things, first stop, the Alzheimer's Association, which is alz.org. It has everything that you and your family might need to know about what you can do, how you can help, what to expect from what kinds of care is available, what kinds of care are warranted at what time. There are local resources. You can find out where there are chapters in your area that have support groups that have memory clinics. There is just so much stuff. And you will quickly find not only that there are a lot of resources, but also that you are not alone and you are hardly the first person who has had these questions. So you also might be able to connect with other folks who are in the exact same situation. And supports for the caregiver team, right? It's not just going to be for your father-in-law and mother-in-law. There will be supports and resources for you and your husband and the siblings and everyone who is part of the care team and the family. We have also found that the visiting nurses, the the visiting nurse association has been magical and transformative. And that doesn't, that even that doesn't mean that there's, you know, a hospital bed and a lab coat in your house. It just means a very nice trained medical person comes to your house and asks you questions and holds your hand, at least metaphorically, and helps assess and recommend even just small practical matters about, you know, moving about the house and adding extra comfort for your loved one. And they even, they have left in case of emergency break glass kind of box in the house with some medications and first aid stuff. And you can call them day or night if you have a need for one of those things and they'll talk you through it. So that's a game changer just for the peace of mind to know that they're on call. And then I think the a big piece, maybe cautious caregiver should do that research, you know, do the Google, figure out what's what, put together the PowerPoint, have the binder together and have that be an exercise that she does. But she can channel her energy right now into a place that could ultimately be very, very helpful when after they've had that family conversation, which is the next piece of super tactical advice, right? You've got to be able to have the family meeting and figure out what are the needs? How urgent is this? How important is this? What are we balancing as a family, as a care team? And in order to have that meeting, in order to really have that meeting be a success, it's important that you know your options. And we are here to help with that. Hang on for just a moment. We will be right back. I'm Jody Rudoran, Editor-in-Chief of The Forward. Every day, my team of creative and passionate journalists works to understand and explain our complex and diverse Jewish world. To cover the rise in anti-Semitism, the changing discourse around Israel, the new trends in Jewish books, film, and food. We're carrying on a 124-year tradition of holding power to account and helping American Jews explore our identities. But we're doing it in new ways that work across generations. 
If you want to keep up with what American Jews are talking about, sign up for our free email newsletters. Just go to forward.com slash newsletter. We have called in today's guest, who is awesome. She is president and CEO of the Jewish Home Family. She is Carol Silver Elliott. Welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So, Carol, you know, I would love to think, actually, sort of widen the aperture a little bit from the question that Cautious Caretaker has raised for us and think about what are some of the values that she and the father-in-law and her husband and brother-in-law are all weighing as they navigate this territory? You know, that's a really interesting question to frame it from a values perspective because we all look at family relationships and preserving family relationships as the most important thing, right? It's, you know, it's my obligation, is sickness and in health, I'm going to be there forever. But we reach that tipping point where sometimes it's really beneficial to take a step back and say, what is this doing to the person who's providing the care? I don't think there's any commandment in Judaism or any other religion that says thou shalt be a martyr to your loved one who has who has medical or cognitive issues. We're talking about various kinds of services. You know, our goal is for the family to feel like the family, right? Don't you want your loved ones to be your loved ones and not your nurse or your aide or your physical therapist? You want them to be your loved one. Also related to that, Carol, is sort of thinking about what does it mean when the daughter or the son versus the care partner versus a sibling feels the way they feel about what needs to happen and what decisions need to be made. What are some tips that we have for, for families in general? I'll give you two pieces to this puzzle, at least from my perspective. The first is we as individuals each have an obligation to make our desires known. Something could happen to any of us tomorrow, right? And there are lots of tools out there to help us to be very clear about what we want and what we don't want. I will tell you that I have an app on my phone that's my advanced directives are on my phone because I, in the event that wow. God forbid something should happen to me, I don't, I don't want my kids to be arguing with one another about what happens. I know I'm very clear about what I want and what I don't want. In, in New Jersey, you could do what's called a pulse. In other states, it's called a mulse. Here, it's physician order for life-sustaining treatment. Sometimes it's medical order for life-sustaining treatment. It exists in lots of states. It allows you to say exactly what you want in exactly every circumstance. So I think that's number one. The second, and it's related, is to have those conversations with your family. Have those conversations you know, I'm not saying this has to be at the Thanksgiving dinner table. <laughs> this is part of the continuum of life. Right. We should be talking about this as the normal order of life. Here's, you know, here's a news flash. From the moment we're born, we start to die. Hmm. So why do we treat it as holy smokes? You know, mom's going to pass away. We're, life is finite. And if we treat it as part of the process, as part of the cycle... How much better that is for everybody, how much more reassuring that is for the older adult, how much kinder it is for the family, and how much it has the potential to eliminate this sort of uh, conflict that we see because the conversation's never been had. Pretending that we're not going to die does not mean that we're going to live forever. Carol, I wanted to think about our system of care for people and seniors in general in the United States. And so for families who don't have access to insurance or a trust fund or high income children or siblings or spouse, what does it actually mean in the United States today to be able to make sure that our seniors actually are able to get what they need as they approach end of life? So not everything is expensive. And I think it's important to recognize that. You know, I believe that day programs are the unsung heroes in the continuum, particularly medical day, because in a medical day program, what you're really talking about is nursing care, social work services, 
assistance with activities of daily living. It's a wraparound service that is really quite wonderful and very underappreciated. And I know that many, many, many day programs, including the one that we have had here, have lots of grant funding, tons of grant funding. We accept Medicaid, we have county grants, we have Alzheimer's grants, we have grants from other places. So if people are income eligible, there are huge sources of funding out there that make things available. And when it gets to a point where there is a need for some sort of a residential placement, there are many public supports for that. If they need assisted living, many, many places will take Medicaid or a spend down to Medicaid. And the same goes up through nursing home and whatever other levels of care there are. So is the system of care for older adults in the United States perfect? Not by a long shot. Is it more expensive, perhaps, than any of us would like to see it? Probably. But there are services and supports. I think what is the most challenging sometimes is finding where they are. You know, sometimes United Ways can tell you. Sometimes you can call, you know, a a place like a federation can tell you. But if there are care management services available in your community, especially through a community social service agency, they can really be invaluable in terms of helping to put that whole picture together. In the few minutes that we have left, if I could bring us back to death uh, for a moment. Um, And um, I'm, you know, it occurs to me that in Judaism, at least at at a level of practice, we are not afraid of death. You know, we have the ritual washing that our community members do of bodies. You know, my my husband's a rabbi and he used to be a congregational rabbi and he would put on his his, his special talus for Yom Kippur and he'd be like, see you later, I'm wearing the talus I'm going to be buried in. You know, like there and there's just this stuff where the, there's practices that we do in in life that never stop reminding us and not in a bad way <laughs> that we're going to die. You know, they remind us of this cycle of life and the way the community participates and witnesses it. Right. And on the other hand, these conversations are super hard. And so I'm wondering, is there a way that we could sort of remind ourselves of this Jewish value presence practice of kind of looking at, you know, looking death in the eye that could help these conversations be easier in that context. Before you jump in on that, Carol, I I wanna point out that yes, we have a tradition deep, long and, and, and storied around how we manage and handle and approach death and lots of ritual associated with it. But we also have superstition. (laughs) <laughs> right yes. about like, oh, yeah, we, totally. we don't, like we don't talk about babies before Kenahara, we're born. Kenahara, 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 Kenahara. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, like, so I feel like those are I feel like those are kind of not warring, but maybe at odds concepts within within the tradition. If we talk about grandma dying, we may kill her. Right. Yeah. We also we also struggle sometimes with. You know, it is um, certainly our practice in Judaism that we don't do anything that will hasten death. And that is a very mm. deeply rooted and, and strongly held belief, which I certainly endorse. And yes. sometimes it creates some conflicting situations. Um, for example, a circumstance I have personally witnessed with an elder who has um, congestive heart failure And continuing to give this person who's at end of life fluid is creating painful pressure. And a hallway discussion with her rabbi about the desire to discontinue the fluid and his sense that if we discontinue the fluid, we're hastening her death. And that tightrope between maybe, but we're also right now causing her agony. And where does that line, where is that line? I will tell you that the rabbi agreed that causing her pain was not what we should be doing, but it was a difficult conversation and a difficult concept for him. I, I think we we face it, we are accepting of death, we, we recognize it, and yet it goes back to our early conversation about the need to normalize. It's not just those of us of the Jewish faith, 
it's societally that we need to normalize the conversations. We also, as individuals, have an obligation to say, who is going to be the decision maker if I can't make that decision, right? You know, my husband and I have seven children. So not all seven of them are going to see the world the same way. So it's very clear to me which of our children I would want to task, burden, or give mm. with the responsibility. But if I make that clear and I put that in writing and I say, this is the child who's going to be responsible, then it clarifies everything both legally and from a family perspective. So there's not all of them clamoring at the same time to have different points of view. So that's also a fundamental thing. Understanding, that's part of the discussion, understanding who in your family sees the world your way and who is willing to support your decisions. Carol Silver Elliott, thank you so much for joining us on a mental brief today. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. My pleasure. And you have won the first round of our new game called Who Has More Kids Than Gina? (laughs) <laughs> you will pro with seven odds are in your favor that you will hold that record for quite some time yep you're gonna keep your place in the bracket i think i only have four <laughs> so six boys and one incredibly fortunate girl mm-hmm. beautiful thanks so much carol that was great thank you it's a pleasure thanks so much take care So right now, as we're talking and as you're listening, Gina and I and all of us are getting older, like right this second. But we all have the opportunity, and I would say actually the responsibility now to think for ourselves and talk with our loved ones about what we want when it comes to end of life care. Not even end, like twilight, twilight of life care. And it's probably true that the sooner the better. That having these conversations, the earlier that we have them, the better means that we can express um, we need as caregivers and care receivers and what we're comfortable with. I mean, this question, it really goes deeper or even deepest into who we are as humans, how we define ourselves in our relationships, how we relate to the experience of being alive. I mean, the thing I'm thinking about a lot as we are wrapping up and dispensing the advice is presumably the father-in-law, the daughter-in-law, and even the sons, even though they don't want to interfere, all want their mother, mother mother-in-law to be cared for. And it still seems at the end of the day, so important that they do have this conversation amongst everyone who's on the care team about what it means for the mother-in-law to get the care that she needs. And that feels like the $64,000 question. Because as of right now, everyone agrees that it's still kind of working. It's still okay. Like at this point, she is still getting what she needs. But we all know what Alzheimer's does. And that will not be forever. Yeah. And, you know, it's true that this shouldn't all be on you, that society should have not only better safety nets, but better plans for all of these things that are literally inevitable. The thing to come back to here is love. You saw it. You said it. He loves her. She knows he loves her. And obviously you love them. Yes. We are going to be right here answering your end of life, middle of life, beginning of life, all of life questions every week. So please send them to us. Don't edit yourself. We'll do it for you. Give us all the information we need because we want to help. So send them on. You can email them or you can call us. Please go on at great length when you call the following number, 201-540-9728. 201-540-9728. Or you can do it the new fashioned way and email us at bintel, B-I-N-T-E-L, at forward.com. This podcast is a product of The Forward. Our editor-in-chief is Jody Rudoran, and our CEO and publisher is Rachel fishman Federson. The show is produced by Wonder Media Network. Our producer is Ira Simonson. Our production assistant is Carmen Borca Carrillo. 
Our executive producer is Jenny Kaplan. Special thanks again to Edward Blank, whose generosity makes this show possible. I'm Rachel Fishman Federson, publisher and CEO of The Forward. We're a reader supported nonprofit, and my job is to make us sustainable so we can continue our 124 year legacy of hosting and driving the most important American Jewish conversations. Our grandparents relied on the forward, and we want to make sure it's here and relevant for our grandchildren. If you care about independent Jewish journalism, please support us with a donation of any size. Go to forward.com slash donate today.